Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome back to our talk on pitfalls and errors in body CT, what they are and how to avoid them. And this is part three, and I think it's going to be three or four. Now, in terms of the stomach, I think we cannot say often enough, maximum gastric distension is necessary if you want to pick up tumors. If the stomach is not distended, you're just not going to see a mass, okay? You're just not going to make the right call. Areas that are particularly difficult, even with distension, perhaps the fundus and antrum, which are the areas least likely to be distended. And also, once you look at the data, multiplanar or even 3D is valuable. Here's a very nice case. Stomach is well distended with water. You see the wall of the stomach. The gastric wall is normal in thickness, typically under 5 millimeters. But if you look hard, there's a five millimeter polyp posteriorly, very nicely shown because the stomach is distended. Another example, patient with abdominal pain, stomach's well distended. Look at the antrum. See the antrum is infiltrated on those images. And you could see that's what happens, the stomach's distended. What about this case? Is this a tumor in the fundus of the stomach? Is there something going on here, or is this normal? I don't think you could make the call. I know the residents always say stomach is normal. I think that's just because it's preset into their um, you know, structured reporting. But I think what you honestly could say here is I can't say anything about the stomach. So what, what is it that you could say? You could look at it some more. Is it thickened? I can convince myself, but I can surely convince myself it's not distended. Well, that patient, guess what? If you had the scan distended, this is the same patient. The patient had hundreds of polyps in the stomach. They were benign polyps, but look how easy it is to see when the stomach's distended. When the stomach's not distended, it's impossible to see the polyps. So again, protocol, technique is going to be everything. Same thing, just a few more images from that patient, really nicely showing in the polyps with a good gastric distension. So again, technique, protocol, we mentioned at the start in the COVID era where you were trying to be very careful with patients, rightly so, you weren't giving patients oral contrast material. You did not want them to take their masks off, nor did they want to take the mask off. And so we need to get back to a better state of where we were. Another example, this is a patient we couldn't tell if it was a gastric mass or maybe a pancreatic mass. What's going on here? You see a little bit of a splenic artery. Notice just carefully that there is nodularity to the liver, which means the liver is cirrhotic. We always make the point in terms of misdiagnosis that when you have a cirrhotic liver, you probably have varices. Varices, if you don't have the timing right, can look very much like adenopathy or a mass. So in this case, I mean, the stomach's well distended. It looks like there's a mass coming off the stomach or maybe off the pancreas. Well, guess what? When you had venous phase imaging, it was all varices. Again, look at this and look at this. So a good rule is about timing when you have liver changes, even when they're not super dramatic. In this case, surely wasn't. It's very easy to make a mistake by the GE junction, especially lower esophagus. But even in this case, where the argument was stomach versus pancreas, and it was simply varices, no need for anything else. And again, varices can be very tricky. Uh, most varices will not opacify in arterial phase, surely early arterial phase, and are best seen, as in this case, in venous phase imaging. Now, I will speak to you a bit more about the pancreas later, and we have an entire talk on pancreatic uh, misdiagnosis. What about the kidneys? I'm not going to cover the kidneys in great detail, but just to make the point and remind you that obviously phase of data acquisition is important. Pyelonephritis, you may not see it on non-contrast. You may see it best on late phase, and sometimes you don't see it very well on early phase. Renal tumor is sometimes the best seen arterially, or only seen arterially, and sometimes the best seen late. Image display format is critical. Looking only at the axials, you can overlook tumors, especially at the upper and lower pole of the kidney. Coronals are a must, and sagittals are pretty helpful as well. And as I'll show you, using 3D imaging in the kidney is very valuable, particularly in things like looking at the calyces for transitional cell, as well as for looking at the ureter. It's important to recognize that non-contrast scans 
are good for stone studies. They're also good for getting the attenuation of a renal mass. Remember, if you have a well-defined renal mass and it measures over 70 Hounsfield units, 99% chance it's a benign high-density cyst. That's kind of easy. Also, you want to be able to look at lesions and see if they're enhancing or not. So non-contrast scans give you that advantage. But if you want to say that, oh, the study's negative because a non-contrast CT shows no mask, I'm going to say you're wrong because many times if a renal mass is small and doesn't bulge the contour, it's easily missed on a non-contrast study. Now, one of the things also we talk about is how 25% of the lesions under 3CM resected classically were benign. There's a number of reasons for that, but here's a good example. This looks like a solid mass in the left kidney, not very vascular, probably a papillary renal cell. Okay, maybe faint calcifications. Looks bad. Here it is on delayed phase, same worry, solid mass. Here it is on another example, high density in the lesion. So what am I showing you here? I'm showing you the fact that you can really be confused by a lesion that's high density when you only have contrast studies. My rule is that if a lesion does not change in density between arterial and venous or venous and delayed, it's going to be a high density renal cyst. You can always prove this by getting a non-contrast scan at a later date. But this is a good example of a lesion that would have been resected both on the early and late phase imaging. It looks worrisome. It's solid, but the density is the same in both phases. It's simply a well-defined high-density renal cyst. We got a non-contrast scan to make everybody happy, and it proved it. And again, here's just a good example of showing you that high-density lesion. High density is shown very nicely on the non-contrast. Remember the rule is anything above 70 Hounsfield units well-defined is going to be a high-density renal cyst. Under 20 is typically a simple cyst. 20 to 70 is the concern zone. The average renal cell carcinoma on non-contrast CT measures 37. Again, emphasizing there's no one perfect phase for all renal masses. They're very variable. Again, reminding you what stone studies are, non-contrast scans to rule out stones in the kidneys or ureter or bladder. But do not infer that the kidney is normal if you don't see a mass on a non-contrast study. It's just a very important rule that we sometimes forget. Now, again, I mentioned about the non-contrast CTs, missing renal tumors, missing polynephritis, and surely vascular pathology. If you look at this case, look at the right kidney, it looks pretty good. But when you give contrast, there's a two centimeter mass in the kidney, which was a renal cell carcinoma. The patient had a partial nephrectomy and did great. Here it is again on the early phase imaging, and here it is on late phase. Again, making the point that if you only had the non-contrast, you would have made a mistake. You would have missed the tumor when it was imminently resectable with a partial nephrectomy. Again. I'll repeat, no one phase is perfect. Another example, what about this lesion in the left kidney? Is that a malignancy or not? Well, you have non-contrast only, you'd want to see it enhance. But if you look very carefully, you can see those little dots I put in the lesion right there. That measured minus 71 Hounsfield units. One of the most common lesions that are resected that are benign or angiomyolipomas. Now, obviously, when you have an AML that has fat within it and it's gross macroscopic fat, it's an easy diagnosis. But sometimes it's easy to miss these small foci of fat. Articles have shown that the best phase to see tiny amounts of fat is actually non-contrast. When you have an area of minus 71 or minus 75, here's with contrast, that's an angiomyolipoma. It's basically a leave alone lesion. Angiomyolipomas sometimes are resected. It typically is when they're over five centimeters because the risk of bleeding becomes much higher. And here very nicely is a cinematic rendering. And it's something we're working on because we want to make certain that people recognize these fat poor AMLs because they're benign leave alone lesions. I mentioned also about display format, but just a good example. If you look at the left kidney and you look at the boundary, there's something going on here, it looks different. But one would have to admit it's hard to visualize 
but it's very easy to visualize on the coronals. So coronals just make life easier. It's easier to follow the cortical medullary interface through the whole kidney, and sometimes small tumors are just going to be missed because of the plane. Again, you must look at the coronals. You must look at the sagittal. Another example, here was a patient read as normal. This was felt to be the upper pole of the kidney, and perhaps it is, but when you scan coronally, it's the upper polarite, but it's an upper pole carcinoma. So again, you need to be very, very careful in making that diagnosis. Again, just a really nice example showing you a renal cell upper pole that was missed. Now there are mimics of malignancy. I think sometimes you are gonna get fooled, things like polynephritis, XGP, renal infarct, and sometimes IgG4 related renal disease. Now, another pitfall is the ureter. Ureter lesions are easy to see if they're causing obstruction, but if they don't cause obstruction, they may not be seen as a problem. Sometimes they don't fill in its entirety and you assume it's okay. But here's a good example. When you look at the ureters, you need to do a wider window because the ureters are very bright and if you only did a routine window, you would not see that lesion present. On the coronal view, beautifully showing you a two centimeter transitional cell carcinoma in the patient's ureter. There's the donut and there it is on the coronal. When you do the 3D mapping, just a beautiful example. This case shows several things. One is I find that using MIP imaging to look at the ureters and renal pelvis is very important. Number two, there are areas of the ureter that may not fill. It doesn't mean it's tumor, it's just peristalsis. But when you have this appearance, it's really much more obvious that that's a lesion. Here it is on the coronal views. But again, I routinely scroll with MIP imaging. I find that very valuable for looking and detecting small TCCs like in this case. And this article by Rahman uh, made the point that uh, ureter evaluation can be difficult, easy to miss ureteral TCCs. Again, protocols, good distension. Again, about a five to six minute delay and then using MIP imaging can be very valuable. Again, the point in these cases, 3D can be very helpful. In our kidney talk, I also speak a lot about looking at the calyces and how it's often difficult to pick up subtle calyceal lesions unless you're very careful because they're easy to walk by. So in the ureter, the role of 3D, accentuation of subtle strictures and sites of narrowing, accentuates subtle abnormal urethelial enhancement and thickening, better visualization of the distal ureter, and better visualization of flat polypoid lesions. Here's a good example. There's some caliectasis in the left kidney. And then when you give contrast, the left kidney does not enhance as well as the right. There's also some irregularity in the borders of the kidney. As you go to excretory phase imaging, you see the calyces are dilated, but then you look right here, you see the proximal pelvis is thickened. Here it is right here. That's not peristalsis like it is on the right side. That's a stricture, that's a TCC with caliectasis. Here it is again very nicely. One thing you could do if you say, well, how do I know it's really a tumor? Maybe it's just peristalsis, but of course we have the transition point here. But what about here? Well, we can look more carefully. And if you track through that region, here it is on the coronal, there's a soft tissue thickening around the ureter. That's the patient's tumor. So a TCC of the patient's proximal ureter, very nicely shown right there. Another example here, you're looking at the kidneys. Looks like they function pretty symmetrically. Let's go down and look a little bit more carefully and look at that patient's left ureter. It's not obstructed, but it's irregular. Now you can come up with all sorts of things like radiation change, fibrosis, inflammation, but that irregularity is classic for a TCC, which this was. But again, you have a TCC, which is obvious on the MIP, but there's no proximal obstruction. People always expect to see proximal obstruction when there's a renal tumor present. The answer is that's not necessarily the case. You can have a reasonable sized tumor, but if it grows to the periphery, you're not gonna have any obstruction present. But look how obvious this TCC is, and this was read as normal on the axial images. Another example, you see the ureters are dilated just a bit. 
Then you follow the ureters down and look at this crescent right here. Looks like you're missing part of the donut. And there it is, that nice donut. That's a filling defect in the ureter. Yes, it could be a non-opaque stone. Yes, it could be a blood clot. But in this case, it's a tumor, which you can see very nicely on the coronal views. So a little bit over one centimeter TCC, very nicely shown. Again, a reasonable size mass, but there's no left hydronephrosis. Again, you're waiting for hydro, you're gonna have a problem. You would not see the lesion. Here it is very nicely on the MIP again. You can see the uh, calyces, the defect, the dilated left ureter. So again, very important. Now let's go through some of the last things. We finished the kidney now. We spoke about the stomach. We spoke about the pancreas a bit. We spoke about the adrenals. What about mesenteric vessels? This is an area where mistakes do happen, but let's do this. I think I've used up my time. Let's come back in a few minutes and start again, and we'll do part four and call it a day. Thanks very much. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.